Namaste and welcome to our continuing series of interviews with disciples and devotees. Today I'm very honored to introduce you to Rajiv Ratan. Namaste. Namaste, Namaste. Namaste. My first question always to everyone is how did you first hear of Sri Aurobindo and Mother? Yeah. And were your family interested also? Yeah, so obviously, as with everyone, you know, the mother has a very different and unique way of getting here, and that was the case with me as well. But before I started, I did want to make a disclaimer that, you know, I, I don't think I'm, uh, you know, qualified or worthy of actually sitting here and being interviewed with you. So it's just your you know, love and affection. So um, I'm happy to do the interview. So the story starts, I was about 12 years old and before that age, I used to get ill very frequently, every two months, three mm. months, four months. Seriously ill? And or it, I'm something or the other. Mm. I mean, I would have to take time off school for four ah. days, five days, one week, ten days. Mm. And it would happen like every two, three months. And I loved going to school and I was, you know, reasonably good in studies. So it was a bit of a dampener. I didn't take, I didn't feel like taking time off and so on and mm. so forth. Oh. And my father was in the central government. He was in the CAG office. And we had the dispensary close to our home where we would go for treatment. So my father, poor fellow, he would come. He used to ride a bicycle those days. And then he would come home and ask my mother that, you know, how did Rajiv go throughout the day? Mm. And she would say, he, no, he's still not well. And immediately, without even having a sip of water, he would take the bicycle, go to the dispensary, mm. talk to the doctor and come back with medicine or whatever. So it, this happened very, very frequently. Mm. And all the tests were done, everything was done, and nothing came positive. So it was all something mysterious. And this is from the age of 12? Before 12. Before so 12. from 6, 7, 8, ah, 9, okay. and up till age of 12. So one evening he came back home, and he said that, um, so he asked the same question and my mother said, no, he's still not well. So he again took the bicycle and went. And he did not come back till about an hour, hour and a half. And there were no mobile phone those days, not even landline. Mm. So no means of knowing where he's gone, what he's doing. So when he came back, he said, well, actually, I never went to the dispensary because um, this friend of mine, and Mr. Nivaran Chandra met me on the way and he took me home. And Nivaranji was a devotee of the mother who had first come to know about Mother Shri in 1956. He had come and had darshan of the mother with his entire family. And he was a really, really realized soul and wonderful experiences he had. So he met him just out of the blue. And he asked him, where are you going? He said, I'm going to dispensary because Raji was sick. And he said, okay, can you just pass by my home? So they went to his home and he gave him a blessing packet. He said, yeah, give him the medicine or whatever, but take this blessing packet and put it under Rajiv's pillow. So my dad never ended up going to dispensary. He actually just brought the blessing packet home. And I still remember it is, it was a shiny silvery blue foil and the mother's picture with the hands like this. So he came and gave it to me with the story that this is what Nivaranji had said. And I just took the blessings in my hand and I looked and I was just 12. I had never seen mother's picture before, not known about them or anything at all. Hmm. And from inside somewhere there was this voice, oh, she's caught me again. Ah, ah interesting. <laughs> and I was just like, where is this voice coming from? That, But nevertheless, so that blessing packet was kept underneath the pillow. And it was about 9 o'clock at night and 12 o'clock midnight, the fever disappeared, the illness has disappeared, that's it. Never, never again. And they never came? Never came back again. Again? Never came In back again. In your life? Never came oh. back. I mean, ordinary illnesses do still, yeah, but, but not the way uh -huh. it was before that time. And then, um, that was yet when I was 12 years old. By year 13, somehow I had this desire to... Um, read Savitri. I wanted to buy a copy of Savitri. Mm. So in those days, the pocket money you would get is like, you know, 
5 rupees or 10 rupees each month and Savitri was 35 rupees. So I actually saved my pocket money, saved my pocket money till, you know, in 1981 I bought the first copy of Savitri. But at 13? At 13. Goodness. And I read what and I movie? read and I just loved it. I could not, it was the most, most, most wonderful thing ever and I just loved it. And I would go to the terrace, you know, we used to live in an apartment, go to the terrace after school and just read. And just reading would, you know, tears would start flowing. So it was, uh, oh. it was amazing. And the same Nivaran uncle, he actually told me when I told him about the Savitri, he said, you realize the importance of what you've done now, several years later. Oh. And the second thing he said is, when, you know, I, he's told us how to write to the mother sweet mother, you know, letter, mm -hmm. or send a money order, and then the blessing package would come. So still, you know, you keep blessing package in the pocket. He said two things. One is, Savitri is the mantra of transformation. This alone is enough. Just keep reading Savitri. And your real wealth is the blessing packet that you carry in your pocket. Nothing else is going to matter. And so you wrote to mother? Yeah, I used to regularly write to mother. Oh. Just regular. But this was 1982, 83. So I would write yeah. and, you know, blessing packets would come and would send on her birthdays, money order oh. and everything. So, But then I started going to the Delhi ashram. There was a Sunday morning satsang. It still is. And there used to be very few people, you know, Johorji, Chachaji. Oh, and so you met? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Johorji and Parasharji used to give talks at that point in time, you know, Indudi would be playing the sitar and Karunadi singing. So for about uh, eight or nine years, I used to go religiously every Sunday. Rain, hail or shine, I would just go every Whoa. Sunday. And there were only in the audience, actually, there used to be hardly three or four people. But I loved it because it was very nice and calm and quiet. So I would just quietly go, sit and come back without talking to anybody at all for all of those nine years. Eight years. Just go there, spend that one and a half hour and come back. What were you studying at that time? I was in school. I was in school. You were still in school? I was still in school. So this is the age of... This is age, year seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And then um, something interesting happened. When I finished my HSC, which is year twelve, I had the option of either going into medicine or going into engineering. And it was a big dilemma. Because there were several you know, factors to consider which one is better, which one will take you where and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And my heart was slightly set more on medicine, but still, you know, a family circumstance, all those things. I wasn't able to make a choice. So as I had realized by that time that you could actually sit with Savitri and, you know, randomly open a page and it will give you the answer. So I was in a huge dilemma and wondering what to do, what to do, what to do. And then I just opened the page and my rank, you, so there's an entrance examination for medicine. So my rank in that examination was 325, I still remember. I opened the page in Savitri, it opened on page number 325. Oh. And then I read the description, it was absolutely beautiful. And I knew there's no question anymore, that's it, that's what I have to do. Huh. So that is how the career in medicine was decided. But the other thing that happened was that I do sincerely believe that for everyone in people's lives, um, you know, circumstances and people are sent to you for not so much as a lesson, but just so to, you know, push you to grow, to make you evolve and for basically, you know, for your soul to blossom. Yes. And during those days, I had the great fortune of having these people like Nivaranji was there. There was Parasharji who was talks were there. And then there was, uh, you know, a very, very dear friend of my father who had come to Sri Aurobindo in 1920s and had actually met the mother and Sri Aurobindo, both. And Sri Aurobindo, he used to say that uh, he waited three months to wait to meet with mother and Sri Aurobindo. And one fine day he decided that he'll go away because Sri is not giving me an audience. And next morning he had a knock on the door 4 o'clock saying that today you have to meet him. Oh my. So he came and met Sri and the mother. Oh, and he just sat in meditation and Sri said, I know the questions in your heart. These are the questions. These are your answers. 
but you have to go and work in the worldly life. And then he went to Delhi and he was in my father's office. But you know, he was such a spiritual, such a radiant person, such a, it was just lovely and amazing love, amazing love and amazing this thing. And so he was there and then you know, another neighbor came who was also, none of these were religious, none of these were dogmatic at all. Mm-hmm. They're all spiritual people, they're all, you know, realized souls. So I had the good fortune of, you know, meeting with them at that impressionable age at 13, 14, 15. And the beauty was that with that blessing packet coming, the whole family turned to Mother Shri So we came, all four of us came to Pondicherry in 1980. And then we used to religiously go to the Delhi Ashram. And then we started coming to Pondicherry, you know, more frequently. And then the whole family just turned. So there's no question in anybody's mind. There was no dilemma or anything. Just the whole family turned, just by that one event. How did you get to Australia? (laughs) Yeah, that is an interesting story as well, because I thought I will never leave India, never leave Delhi. But uh, an opportunity came up in the Middle East, so I went to Bahrain. And then... um, um, Another opportunity came and it just landed me in Australia. So, fate kind of, you know, pushes you, mm. destiny pushes you and that is where it was. And uh, one actually interesting story from Bahrain is also this connected with uh, Mother and Sri Bindu, is that my daughter was born when I just reached Bahrain and we were trying to decide on a name. And uh, we were going through several names and the name Ahana somehow stuck to me that this is a nice name. And I had read Sherbindo's collected poems as well by that time uh-huh. and other works, but I had never realized oh. that Sherbindo has written a poem called Ahana. Ahana. Yes. I never realized that, surprisingly. But um, for whatever reason, we decided to name our daughter Ahana. And the meaning of Ahana in pure Sanskrit is the first ray of the sun. But when I saw Sherbindo's transliteration, it is actually a descent of divine incarnate. And it was just a yeah. accident, just a coincidence. And I was so, so touched by that. But uh, yeah, so 12 years ago, I reached Australia and Sydney and started working there. And uh, always at the back of my mind, somewhere it was that if, you know, the mother were to allow me the means to have something, a place on my own, that would be a place dedicated to a mother. It would be consecrated to the mother. That I always had at the back of my mind. So about six and a half years ago, we were looking for a house, looking for a house, looking for a house in Sydney. And we had seen 55 houses, 55. So week after week, week after week, week after week. And nothing would suit, nothing would work. And suddenly one day I got up in the morning and I had to see one house and it suddenly come to me that I'm approaching it from a completely wrong angle. I'm looking for a house for myself. No, I should be looking for a house for mother. So this was 6 in the morning, 8.30 we were in the car, 9 o'clock we decided. Oh, you just (laughs) found the right place. Just the right place. Just the right place. And then, of course, you know, we built the house and everything. So it was, you know, consecrated to the mother and we had a nice place for meditation, everything. But I was thinking that there's still something missing, something missing. And my sister and mother were there in Sydney at that point with us. The design had been done. Everything was there. The meditation hall was there. I was thinking, what is missing? What is missing? And then it suddenly almost, you know, I could see that the pillars outside had mother's signature. So then I said, yes, that's what is missing. So then that, you know, even the name Gratitude, so the house was called Gratitude. So the name Gratitude came and then the mother's signature came. And then I had a local person do a computer engraving on a Ah. sandstone. And that was then put there. But I always did feel even at that time, even now, that just the fact that the mother's signature is touching the physical soil in Australia that has an occurred significance. 
that is that is what could you tell me a little bit about your own choir yes so in very interestingly enough and this was not planned it is just one of those mother's accidents or mother's coincidence or her grace as always that we built the house we moved in on 2nd of september 2013 and i had been in conversation with alok bhai for a long time oh. for him to come to sydney oh. and but it just so happened that we moved in 2nd september and he was our first guest he came on 18th september oh. and then he did a few talks and then it was also very interesting both of us were he was working on a computer i was working on a computer and he said rajiv bhai actually i've come to sydney and it is good to have these talks but if something regular were to happen i said oh you i took a paper out from the printer i said this is what you're talking about he said oh you have it ready oh. <laughs> so that is how it happened so we just said to anyone that we'll meet uh, we'll start with meeting once a month and that is how it will start and then people just joined in people yeah so everybody just came satsang. together yes it is a real satsang and the satsangs in fact started um we started with mother's music reading of savitri and pratap bhai you know is there um, pratap amin bhai so he brings the harmonium and renuka didi and both of them will sing bhajans but again we kept feeling that something is missing something is missing and at that point in time just i was looking at youtube videos and then narad's om choir's video came up <laughs> and we said this is it <laughs> oh. and then i suggested to the group and we were just we had just started sasang 2 or 3 months ago so this is almost late 2013 oh. and everybody said oh that's a fantastic idea and we just started with that and everybody loved it absolutely loved it and it kept evolving like um initially we just used to do om and then um, somebody suggested that we have to do the breathing exercises the diaphragm exercises mm. vocal exercises and then oh. so we started doing that and there's another gentleman who is also very very sincere and devoted he said after om kaur you know we have to be silent for some period of time like you know it's like milking a cow filling the bucket with milk and then you know knocking it down so because that the vibration, vibration should stay so it all evolved it all evolved but now it is it is amazing it is just absolutely amazing how many people attend so you do you usually the minimum will be around 7 or 8 Oh. but usually we have 14 15 16 people at end the maximum was i think 34 or something hmm. yeah and uh, we started in sydney in 2013 australia never had anything like that actually that was the only continent where there was nothing of this sort a center or a study circle or something at all professor natkarni had gone to melbourne several years ago but there was nothing regular that was happening but we started in 2013 and then in melbourne dhanil Trivedi and Arun Joshi started nearly soon after 2014 or 15. So there are now two Sydney and Melbourne, and Melbourne also is done regularly each month, and Sydney as well. It is just and again the occult significance. You know, I read that in the in that evolutionary process in the Chinese philosophy as well as the um, scriptures. This you know, it is the dragon or the snake. So mm. when the, the snake's mouth and tail yes. meet. that is the realization and that mouth of the snake or the dragon is actually south east australia oh interesting so that is why you know in that sense you know i could have gone to any other town or city in australia but it just so once again coincidentally happened it was sydney so but it all kind of yeah fits in can you tell me a little bit about your work and the people you meet Yes so I am my profession a doctor I'm a radiologist and my wife is a pediatrician and uh, we work in the public system as well as the private system in Australia it's very 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 busy working there but the system is I would believe one of the most uh, efficient healthcare systems in the world mm. I've seen the US system the Canadian system the Indian UK but Australia is still does well the people who work especially in healthcare even in the other parts are quite uh, honest and they actually feel that they have to do the right thing which is a great thing to work with which is absolutely great but um, through the study circle of course there are people from all walks of life who just joined people you know who just came to know through facebook or something else and it is amazing people how they came to know and how they 
arrived it is it just there's so many stories so many stories there and all stories of mother's grace have you met any of them who were devotees or disciples yes really? yes 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 absolutely yeah 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 so they are called yes absolutely Marvelous. absolutely yes tell me a little about your children so my son rithik is uh, 19 he just started doing medicine now this year and my daughter is ahana as i said the yes. name <laughs> and she is just finishing high school she'll finish next year do you plan to stay in australia or do you have any thoughts about being in the ashram again or so uh, visiting here yeah so i every time i come to india i do come to pondicherry but the interesting part is i never planned to go to australia i never planned to go mm. outside india at all you know mother just carried me there so as long as she wants me to be there i'll be there that's the only thing and interesting it is you know just uh, i remembered something some really touching um, instances two of them actually if, if i may you know i'd come here like you asked me about coming to pondicherry so i'd come here i often come here but about on a visit five or six years ago it was the last day and i was about the taxi was waiting outside the ashram and i was about to head to the airport to chennai and uh, i was standing at the samadhi the, so in the afternoon of the samadhi it just been cleaned so there were some flowers for prasad so the flowers are in my hand and i'm just standing there and you know when you're going away you obviously feel you're going away from your home so you have that you know sadness that you know yes. you're going away from yes. pondicherry yes. but then i looked at the flowers and somehow the thought came in my mind that you know by the time i reach sydney these flowers will all wilt and this thing if there was some rose petals they would stay it just just a thought and mm-hmm. i'm not saying anything and i didn't want to ask anybody or anything but one of the ladies who you know i know very well was cleaning the samadhi at that point i'm just finishing i had just thought about it she turned around faced me and said come here and thrust a bunch of rose petal in my hand oh. you said you had one other to share with us the i was flying again i was coming to india from and i was flying sydney to singapore and there was you know work was stressful life was stressful a lot of things were going on and i thought i will not watch tv normally you know in the plane you watch end up watching tv or reading something mm-hmm. i thought i will not read anything not watch tv 8 hours i just sit in solitude just sit in solitude and do nothing mm. and let mother solve it for me so i'm just sitting 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 6 and a half hours passed that's it i'm not spoken to anybody i'm just sitting and then something from inside came to me then mother give me a sign give me a sign that you are there with me give me a sign that i am on the right path give me a sign that you know i'm not astray and it just you know there's very sincere aspiration welling from me and i don't know why i decided i'll not read i took that singapore uh, airlines magazine out of the folder the you know the folder lying in front of me mm-hmm. and the front page was a travel article the front cover had you know pondicherry a travel destination ah oh. oh, yeah okay you know maybe they'll be talking about some tourism sure. this that is so i'm just idly flipping in the center spread full pictures of mother and shirt oh my god full center spread big pictures so on a flight from sydney to singapore uh, in mid air 40000 feet how how is that possible really uh, i wanted to ask you also about uh, ashramites that you have known yeah i'm i'm sure there have been many you've mentioned the people in uh, new delhi yeah what about here in sri arbindo ashram pondicherry so in sri arbindo ashram pondicherry obviously i did not have the good fortune of having sri arbindo and mother's darshan and amalda and erodha i just met very briefly and you know that actually you know I, we sat down the entire family sat down with him for half an hour and we had a lovely lovely conversation but with champaklaji there was some sort of a bond there was some sort of i don't know what it was because obviously champaklaji would not speak but i remember uh, i had once written to the ashram 
<clears throat> and I actually wrote a written letter to the mother, and the reply came from Champaklaji. Oh. And he said he had sent a picture of the samadhi, and a small handwritten note which I still have. And then even after that, once more I wrote to the mother, and the reply came from Champaklaji. Oh. So twice that happened. Then he had come to Delhi because he was taking the relics to some other place. I've forgotten which. Mm-hmm. But in the Delhi ashram, people knew that Champaklaji is coming, so there was lots and lots of people. And I never wanted to, you know, kind of be in the front or anything, so I was just sitting at the back, right at the back. So the meditation finished, and everybody was going up to do pranam and then meet Champaklaji and then go. And I was amongst the last people to go to him. Almost the entire hall had emptied out, so I went up to Champaklaji, and I don't know what came to him or something. There was a marigold garland lying there. He just t- took it and put it around oh. my head. And, <laughs> and he just kept smiling, kept smiling, kept smiling. You know, I just, just couldn't control my tears at all and I just went. The second thing, the second episode was again in uh, Ashram in Delhi. You know, I had, um, I was doing a lot of poetry. I was writing poetry, doing oh. painting you know, theatre and all those music and all those sort of things. So I'd done, in fact, I'd done a lot of sketches of Mother and Sri and a painting of the Mother coming down the steps of the meditation yes. hall. So Champaklalji had come to Delhi. So I took the painting to him. And he, you know, he looked at it and he smiled and beamed. That was fantastic. But the third time was the last time that I met Champaklalji. He'd come to Pondicherry to the ashram. And Champaklaji was just staying at that time in the room right next to Sri room. So we took special permission to go and see him. So we had gone to Sri room after meditation. You know, we waited and then went into Champaklaji's room. So all of, you know, the four of us from the family, oh. we went in. And Champaklaji was sitting up on the bed. And he gave each one a blessing packet and a hibiscus flower. And I took the flowers from him and the blessing from him, just looking at me like that. He's just looking. And I couldn't take my gaze away from him. But then, you know, obviously I was just standing there, so I had to walk. And when I'm walking out of the room, he actually did this. And he kept looking at me with the same smile. And I had reached the gate, then I turned around and he was still looking at me like this. And smiling and smiling. And again, you know, I couldn't control my tears and anything. So I, I don't know. It was such a, such a, such a special moment. Please tell me a bit about your art, artwork, and painting. Yeah. So how it did, also how quite did it come to you. Did it just spontaneously develop? It is. It is pretty much spontaneous. But even in at a very young age, I think I was ten or twelve. Again, people are sent to you for a specific purpose. So we had two art teachers who kind of literally opened our vision. They were remarkable teachers and very, very passionate, but they were very loving. And they just opened the, you know, kind of all the blocked channels, so to say. And they gave us not only the technique to draw and paint, but they gave us the vision. They told us what cubism meant with, you know, Picasso. But they also said that start using your imagination that the sun is uh, orange and round and everything but your sun could be a triangle and red or green so you decide how your sun is going to be so they opened that kind of vision for us and poetry was obviously you know because i was reading shirvindo's poetry and niroda's poetry and a lot about inspiration so i would just sit early morning late evening and just wait for inspiration to come and just start writing, just start writing, just start writing. So I thought, you know, I'll not allow the mind to interfere. Of course, the mind interfered. But as much as possible, I would just allow whatever came to just inspiration then to write it. So that... Uh, Have you saved any of those poems? Yes, yes, they are actually. Do you remember anyone? No, I do not. No, I do I not. I have difficulty with that. Also. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. But I've written them down. So. Yes, I have also written them down, but I don't remember any of them, no. Well, we have uh, known each other for quite some years now. Yeah. And it is always a moment of joy when I visit you and you come to the ashram. 
somehow we know that we have been together before in other lives. Absolutely. In absolutely. other worlds. Absolutely. And certainly we are mother's children. We are all mother's children. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much, Narayan. Thank you so much.